Welcome as we continue on our study through the book of Genesis. Today we're going to take a look at the sixth day of creation when the land animals and when human beings were created. We're going to start at Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 24, and God willing, we'll make it all the way through the end of the chapter. So we're going to take a look at this together, and maybe we just do the very briefest of reviews by examining what happened on the first five days of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the subsequent verses sort of lay it out day by day what God did on each day of creation. So here's just a quick overview of that. On day one, light was created and divided from the darkness. On day two, the creation of the atmosphere was fashioned by dividing the firmaments. Day three, the land was divided from the sea and plants and vegetation were created. On day four, the sun, moon, and the stars were created. And then on day five, the creatures of the sea and the air were formed, uh, if you will, the fishes and the birds. So that takes up the first five days of creation and brings us to the sixth day of creation when God made land animals. At least that's what's described in the first two verses of Genesis chapter one, which describes, if you will, part one of what God did on the sixth day of creation. Here we go. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, where we read. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, on the fifth day of creation, God made the birds and the sea animals, but now God turned his creative attention towards land animals of various types. And he said, let the earth bring forth the living creature, the living creatures. In verse 25, he says that God made the beast of the earth according to its kind. Now, when we take a look at the incredible variety of the beasts of the earth. Now, I'm not even talking about the fishes, and I'm not even talking about the birds. That was on the fifth day of creation. This is the sixth day of creation. But if you take a look at all of those together, land animals, air animals, and sea animals, it's an infinite variety. And especially when you consider those animals which are living now and that have been extinct in the past. We're absolutely impressed. You might even say stunned with God's creative power. I would also say it tells us a little bit of something about God's sense of humor. Think about what God has done in creation. God made in his creative work the giraffe. You have to admit, giraffe is a somewhat ridiculous looking animal, but it's suited to its environment and it gets along just fine. But God not only made the giraffe, God also made the platypus, that strange looking animal that's part bird, part, you know, land animal, part sea animal, part beaver, part, it's just a strange animal. The same God who made the peacock, that's a God of joy and humor. Now, I find it interesting, and again, Friends, I I don't want to try to present myself to you as some kind of expert in biology or the sciences. I I, I only know what I read. And to be honest, I'm more interested in the Bible itself than in science. I, I thank the Lord for the people who are skilled in the sciences. My own life, and I'm sure your life, we benefit from that tremendously. But the, the things that I have read, or comes, they're of interest to me. For, for example, if you take that bird that we call the peacock, or the female version of that bird, the peahen. Now, uh, apparently, this is just from what I read, to a peahen, the most attractive peacocks are the ones with the biggest fans. That's on the tail of the bird. But the tail makes it difficult for that bird to escape a predator. Therefore, you could say that the peahen 
rewards the peacock with the least chance of survival. And that's just one example of a natural phenomenon that sort of presents a problem for the idea of survival of the fittest. Now, the general idea of survival of the fittest and adaptability to the environment, yes, those are observable and, and we learn a lot from those principles as they work themselves out through biology of all kinds all over the earth. But there are strange disruptions in those general principles. Now, one other thing I want you to notice, uh, according to Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, specifically verse 25, when it talks about the creation of these land animals, it uses the phrase, according to its kind. That important phrase is emphasized. God allows tremendous variation within a kind, but one kind never becomes another kind. The example that we've used before is, is among dogs. A, a teacup chihuahua and a Great Dane are very different, but they're of the same kind. Neither one of them is a giraffe or a platypus and never will be because there's tremendous variation within a kind be it God created things according to its kind. Now going on here, Genesis chapter 1, let's take a look at verse 26 together, where after the creation of the land animals, so on the fifth day of creation, we had the sea creatures. Um, we also had on the fifth day of creation, the, the air creatures, if you want to say, the birds of the air. And then on day six, we had the land animals. Now, a sort of the crowning achievement of God's creation. Now, in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Here, before the creation of man, God does something that he doesn't do in any of the other days of creation. He announces an intention to create something before actually creating it. And God says there in verse 26, let us make man in our image. Now, the repeated use of those plural pronouns, let us, instead of let me, in our image, instead of in my image, according to our likeness, instead of saying, according to my likeness, that is consistent with the idea that there is one God in three persons, what we know as the Trinity. Now, I understand there are people who explain this by saying God just speaks here in sort of the... Um, the plural of majesty, I think, is the phrase that's often used. And be that as it may, this is certainly consistent. Leopold, in his commentary, does a very good job of showing that the plurality here of let us make and um, uh, in our image, it cannot merely be the plurality of royalty, nor can it be God speaking with and to the angels. But Leopold, in his commentary, does a good job of saying this is an indication of the Trinity. It's not spelling it out in any great detail, but with the classic biblical understanding of one God in three persons, the, the triune God, as it unfolds in the rest of the scriptures, this is completely consistent with that. And as God says in verse 26, let us make man in our image. I believe, and I believe this very strongly, that any understanding of who man is, and of course I'm using man there in the collective of humanity, any understanding of who man is begins with knowing that we are made in the image of God. This sets humanity apart from every other order of created being because he has a created consistency or compatibility with God. 
there is an unbridgeable gap between human life and animal life. Now, I, I know that as far as biological structure is concerned, there's a great similarity between all mammals, let's just say. You know, there's, there's a spine, there's, you know, certain things with the hips and the legs and the limbs and, and the feet or the paws or whatever. There's, there's remarkable similarities in structure among all animals and some more than others. So even though human beings are biologically similar to certain animals, we are distinct from them in our moral, intellectual, and spiritual capabilities. So there is a gap between human life and animal life because human beings are made in the image of God and animal life is not. It doesn't mean that animal life is of no value. No, not at all. They've been made by a wise and good creator, but it means that there's a difference in the value between human life and animal life. I remember hearing years ago about somebody who would ask a group of students. Let's see if I can remember the question properly in my mind. They would ask this question. Um, if if uh, people were drowning in a lake and you had the opportunity to save a stranger, someone you didn't know at all, or your own pet, your own beloved dog or cat, which would you save? And a startling number of people said, I'd save my pet. Now look, on an emotive level, I understand that. And uh, we do have a wonderful connection with our pets. And that, that's sort of one of the benefits that God has given us in this world. It's a blessing, to be honest. But, but we can never forget that there's an essential difference between that dog or that cat or whatever the pet may be that you love and have on some level a relationship with and a human being who's made in the image of God. So there is an unbridgeable gap between human life and animal life, and there's an unbridgeable gap between human life and angelic life. You know, uh, human beings, the animal population, and uh, such, th that's not the only beings in this universe. We know that there are also angelic beings. Nowhere in the Bible are we told that angels are made in the image of God. I think that has a lot of repercussions. But one thing I believe is interesting about that is I would say that angels cannot have the same kind of relationship with God that human beings can have. Well, I'm not saying that the angels have no relationship with God. But even as two human beings can have a relationship that a human being and a cow can't have, so as being made in the image of God, human beings have the capability for relationship with God, the same kind of love and fellowship with God we have that angels cannot have. And of course, this means that human life has intrinsic value. It has value built into it, quite apart from the quality of life that might be experienced by any individual. Why? Because human life is made in the image of God. Now, you see uh, a special needs child may be limited in their mobility or their ability to communicate. They're still made in the image of God. You see that person at the end of their life. There they are. They, they can't think right anymore. Their, their body doesn't work right. They're made in the image of God. Human life has inherent value. And we can't just judge the value of human life by what it might contribute to other people or causes or by what we on the outside think, well, they don't have a quality of life. Let them die. There's disturbing things afoot in the world today. They're nothing new. These are trends that have been 
on their way for decades, where human life is disregarded. It's disregarded in the womb. It's also disregarded in these quality of life circumstances. Now, when God said, let us make man in our image, I would say that there are several specific things in humanity that show us to be made in the image of God. Uh, Mankind alone has a natural countenance that looks upward. Mankind alone has such a variety of facial expressions. Mankind alone has a sense of shame that will express itself in a blush. Mankind alone speaks in any intelligible or communicative way. Mankind alone possesses personality, morality, and spirituality. Now, friends, look, I know that you love your dog. I know that you love your cat. I know that dolphins are really smart and gorillas have amazing abilities. But between all these forms of animal life, which again are gifts of God and amazing creations within themselves, there's a gap between them and humanity because human beings are made in the image of God. I I would say that there are at least three aspects to the idea that we are made in the image of God. And I just touched on those three aspects in a moment. Let me develop them just a little bit further. To be made in the image of God means that like God, we possess personality. We have knowledge, feelings, and a will in a way that sets us apart from all other animals and plants, of course. It also means that after the pattern of God, human beings possess morality. We can make moral judgments. We have a conscience that's unlike anything in the animal kingdom. And then thirdly, it means that human beings possess spirituality. Human beings were made for communion with God. And it is on the level of spirit that we communicate with our maker, with God. Now, let me add another thing. When it says, let us make man in our image, it does not mean that God has a physical or human body. John chapter 4, verse 24 tells us that God is spirit. And though God does not have a physical body, and I'm leaving out the idea of the incarnation for right now, apart from the incarnation, God does not have a physical body, but God designed man so that his physical body could do many of the things that God does. Friends, according to the Bible, God sees, God hears, God smells, God touches, God speaks, God thinks, God plans, and so forth. Well, God has given us a human body so that we can do these things that God can do. Human beings can see, hear, smell, touch, speak, think, plan in a way, again, unknown with the rest of animal creation. Let let me read you a quote from the commentator Leupold again. He says this, will be hardly safe to say that the body of man is patterned after God because God, being an incorporeal spirit, bodiless spirit, cannot have what we term a material body, yet the body of man must at least be regarded as the fittest receptacle for the man's spirit, and so must bear at least an analogy that is so close that God and his angels choose to appear in human form when they appear to men. Have you considered that? When God and even the angels choose to appear to humanity, they appear in human form. That's how suitable the human form was for, if we could say, the image of God. So God says, let us make man, verse 26, 
in our image according to our likeness. Now, those terms in the original Hebrew for image and likeness are slightly different. Image has more to do with appearance, and likeness has more to do with what you might call an abstract similarity. But they both essentially mean the same thing here in context. I don't think God's trying to say dramatically different things when he's saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. I would see more this as an example of Hebrew repetition for the sake of intensity. By repeating himself with similar, those slightly different words, God is emphasizing the fact that humanity is made in his image. Now, verse 26, if we could just take another quick look at it, says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Before God ever created man, he decreed that man would have dominion over the earth. And I want you to notice, a little later, we're going to see that God creates man, male and female, and he gave them dominion. In other words, the dominion that humanity has is for men and women together. It's not like God only gave uh, males dominion over the earth. No, God gave mankind dominion over the earth. But he definitely gave us dominion over the earth. Man's preeminence in regard to the created order, man's ability to affect his environment like no other creature on earth can, that's no accident. It's a part of God's plan for man and for the earth. And man's ability to affect his environment has obviously in many, many ways been a good thing. You could say that virtually every technological advance and innovation over the entire history of man has been man affecting his environment in some way. However, we would also say that there are times and situations in which that power to affect the environment has been used in a bad way. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the dominion and the mandate that God gives to humanity. But it's all part, part, I should say, of God's plan for humanity and for the earth. If man does not use this dominion responsibly in the sense of proper stewardship of the earth, then God will hold man to account for that. It's sin for man to do that. All right, let's take a look now at our next set of verses. We've talked about... uh, First of all, God creating the land animals. This is all in the sixth day of creation. Verse 26 is God's intention to create man uh, after his own image. Now, starting at verse 27 through to verse 31, we're going to talk about God actually creating um, man according to that original desire that he said in verse 26. So here we are. We're going to start at verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God created man according to his plan as described in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. 
And the concept of man being created in the image of God was repeated to give emphasis to the idea. The way Genesis chapter 1 presents it to us is that we're plainly told that God created man fully formed and created him in one day. Not, not gradually over millions of years of progressive evolution. The idea that a slow progressive evolution could produce a complex mechanism like the human body, it, in my perspective, it just doesn't add up. You see, it's said that there would be at least 40 different stages of evolution required to form an eye. Now, what possible benefit could there be for the first 39 stages? There was a mathematician who argued that it's highly improbable for the eye to evolve by the gathering of all these small mutations because the number of mutations must be so large and the time frame was not available, not nearly long enough in all the history of the earth for them to appear. An evolutionist named Ernst Meyer commentated. He said this, and again, this is from Philip Johnson's Darwin on trial. He said, somehow or another, by adjusting these figures, we will come out all right. We're comforted by the fact that evolution has occurred. But then, as Johnson observes on this, he said, Darwinism, or evolution, to them was not a theory open to refutation, but it was a fact to be accounted for. Charles Darwin wrote this. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Well, friends, it seems that that's the case. Again, Philip Johnson records that uh, Richard Goldschmidt, a geneticist at the University of California at Berkeley, he listed a series of complex structures going from the hair of mammals to hemoglobin that he thought could not have been produced by thousands of years of small mutations. And then he remarked, and this is quoting again Goldschmidt, he says, the Darwinists met this fantastic suggestion with savage ridicule. This time I was not only crazy, but almost a criminal to suppose that such a random event could reconstruct even a single complex organ, like a liver or a kidney, is as about as reasonable to suppose that an improved watch can be designed by throwing an old one against the wall. Friends, again, I, I think we just have to be plain with what the text tells us. Th this argues for the sudden emergence of humanity on the earth and, and not the gradual forming of the human body over millions of years of progressive evolution with tiny incremental changes. It, it just doesn't explain the complexity of biological life forms. Now, something else that we want to notice in verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, this should not be construed to mean that Adam was originally some sort of androgynous being, being both male and female. That's not the idea at all. One thing that we need to remember, and, and I'll admit it sometimes makes it difficult or a challenge for understanding the Bible in some of its finer points. The Hebrew name Adam means man or humanity. It's not only a name. So when you talk about man or mankind, it's Adam. So when we read God created man in his own image, it uses man in the sense of humanity, not the singular male individual that we know as Adam. Now, believe me, there was a singular male individual whom we know as Adam, and he had a wife named Eve, and we'll talk more about them in our next study. We can get into chapter 2. But both male and female, both of them, 
were created in his own image. And this passage of Genesis gives us an overview of God's creation of man. Genesis chapter 2 is going to explain exactly how God created male and female. This is the overview, just telling us that he did it. Now, in our day, many people say they make two great errors. One error is to say, well, God says there that he made a male and female, but actually there's, there's innumerable genders. And a matter of fact, people can change or declare or create their own gender identity. Friends, I think this is completely foreign to the teaching of the Bible. That gender does match with biological sex. And while we would admit there are vast variations in personality, of course there are. But if you take a woman who's something of a tomboy, she's still a woman, just of a particular personality. It doesn't change the fact that she's female, that she's a woman. And the same thing if you were to take a man who might be softer, maybe in a derisive way, someone might call him effeminate. He's still a man, just of a particular personality. So the Bible makes it very clear. Male and female, he created them. And while we understand that there are many people, especially in our present age, that are massively confused about this matter, we need to treat that confusion with a lot of love, a lot of grace, a lot of compassion. But not everybody's confused. Some people reject God's created order of male and female out of almost pure rebellion. They are rejecting God as creator and saying, I would create myself. You see, when somebody is confused about their gender or declaring themselves to be of a different gender, one of these whatever varieties that people say they might be. Not all of them are rebels in it, in the sense of a conscious rebellion. Not all of them are confused. There's a mixture of them all. and We need great wisdom by the Holy Spirit to know how to minister in truth and in love to such individuals who who would really, whether they do it on the basis of confusion or rebellion, they're going against God's created order. Male and female, he created them. Now, here's another aspect of it. In our day, many people also say that there's no real difference between men and women. Now, this makes sense if someone might say we're the result of mindless evolution, but not if it's true that male and female, he created them. To God, the differences between men and women are not accidents. Since he created them, the differences are good. The differences are meaningful. Friends, men are not women, and women are not men. I, I know there may be objections, People talk about the phenomenon of some people being intersex, where they're born with some kind of um, defect or difficulty, where maybe their hormonal makeup or their genital expression isn't purely male or female. Friends, th those people should be regarded as the exceptions that prove the rule, and they need to be treated with all the love and the compassion in the world. But those people are exceedingly rare, where there is a true biological basis for gender confusion. Now, again, men are not women. Women are not men. And one of the saddest signs, I would say, of our culture's depravity is the amount and the degree of gender confusion today. And might I say, when we say that there's a distinction, that there's a difference between men and women, it's vain to wonder if men or women are superior to the other. Let me tell you something. A man is absolutely superior at being a man. 
A woman is absolutely superior at being a woman. But when a man tries to be a woman, or when a woman tries to be a man, you have something very inferior inherently in that. So God created them, and then it says in verse 27, God blessed them. When God created humanity, creating them as male and female, and again, this is a survey. Next time we get together into chapter 2, we're going to see specifically how God created man and woman, male and female. Here it's just the overview. But when God created man and woman, male and female, the first thing he did to humanity was bless them. Without the goodness of God's blessing, human life would be not only unbearable, but it would also be impossible. And God also gave a mission, a job to humanity. You saw it there in verse 28, where it says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. God gave humanity the responsibility to fulfill God's intention of exercise of dominion over the earth. And again, inherent in this command to have dominion over the earth is that man should be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Man cannot fulfill God's plan for him on this earth unless he populates it. Now, how, how were this original creation of God, as we're going to see in greater detail next time in, to Genesis chapter 2, one man and one woman, how could they populate the earth? Well, one of the ways that God facilitated this was to give mankind a desire for sexual relationships. This would obviously make the populating of the earth faster and more likely. I mean, if there was uh, an attraction, a, a, a desire to do that which would reproduce, more reproduction would be likely. But we err when we think that being fruitful and multiplying is God's only purpose for sex, or it was his chief purpose for sex. I don't believe that's the case. I think when you take a look at what the Bible says in its fullness, the main or chief reason, please hear me, not the only reason, but the main or the chief reason why God created sex was for it to contribute to the bonding together of a one flesh relationship. As we're going to see next time in Genesis chapter 2. I find I'm saying that a lot during this study, but you'll, you'll understand. God brought man and woman together, Adam and Eve, in what he called a one flesh relationship. Now that's different than the mating patterns of animals, even those animals that seem to mate for life. Friends, with the rarest of exceptions, Animals have sex only for reproduction. But sexual response in human beings is different from animal sexual response in many ways. And again, I'm talking in the main. Uh, I'm sure that there are rare exceptions in the animal kingdom having these things. But in general, all of these things are true. That, that human sexuality is profoundly different than that which generally exists in the animal world. For example, human ovulation in the female, in the woman, of course, has no outward sign, not, not as it is in the animal kingdom. Humans, as opposed to the animal kingdom, uh, tend to have sex in private. Humans have secondary sexual characteristics, such in human beings, females develop breasts before before they give birth, which again is different than, than mammals in the rest of the animal kingdom. Only humans demonstrate what might be called a constant availability for an interest in sex, as opposed to animals which sort of have a heat season. When they've ovulated and when they can uh, reproduce, that's when they're interested in sex. It's different in the human, uh, in, in humanity, among humanity. And in humans, the duration of the sexual interlude is generally longer 
and the intensity of the pleasure of sex is stronger. Now, only human beings continue to have sexual relations after the end of fertility. Again, speaking general, generally, in the animal kingdom, once fertility is over, they just don't have sex anymore. Not so among human beings. Now, none of those things just listed, none of those specifically human dimensions of sex are required for reproduction. But all of them are useful for sex as a way to bond together a man and a woman in a lifelong loving relationship. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the portion speaking of this one flesh relationship between Adam and Eve as a prototype for marriage and for the rest of humanity. Now, in verse 29 of Genesis chapter 1, God points out that the fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food. And then later on, I've given every green herb for food. God gave man dominion over the whole earth. But in this Genesis chapter 1 mandate, only vegetation is specifically mentioned as being for food. Seemingly, before the flood, humanity was vegetarian. But after the flood, mankind was given permission to eat the flesh of animals. That's very interesting. There could be many different reasons for that, but it's just interesting that there's no mention of humanity eating meat of animals and such until after the flood. But the bottom line is, and we find this now at the very end of this portion of Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, where it says, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. God's final analysis of his work of creation is that it was very good. God was pleased with his creation, and so are we. Friends, isn't it an amazing world that God has created for us? Don't we see it? Almost everywhere you look, down to the smallest things seen by the most powerful microscope, to what can be seen with just the, the, the naked eye as we look across creation, to what can be seen with the most distant telescope, God saw everything that he made, and it was very good. Now, when God pronounced the creation good, he meant it. At that time, it was entirely good. There was no death, no decay on earth at all. Now, before we finish this look at the sixth day of creation, let, let's be very straightforward about this. The Genesis account for the origin of humanity does not match well with modern evolutionary theory. I know there's people that reconcile the two, and I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not they're successful. I, I'm, not, I'm not impressed by those. I, I don't think such people are necessarily heretics, although some of them are. But I, I'm not impressed. I, I would just say that the Genesis account for the origin of humanity doesn't match well with modern evolutionary theory. And there's many reasons why researchers and scientists promote the evolutionary theory of human existence. One of the most popularly promoted reasons is the claim that the fossil record supports the evolutionary origins of man. You, you've probably seen it as well as I have, those the descent of man or the ascent of man. You know, you, you, you've got something that looks very much like a, a monkey at one end of the chart, and then you're progressively larger and more sophisticated, all the way resulting in man. You know, there's this long list of humanity. And the impression that we're given is that there's just this very tight fossil evidence for every step along the way and how those steps link. And, and it's all very understood by the scientists. Friends, I, I, from, again, the limited resource, I, I'm not trying to here pretend to be a scientist, but I think there's good reason to call that evidence into doubt and to say that the 
evolutionary presentation of the fossil evidence has at times been touched with a fair amount of dishonest science and wishful thinking. Th th these fossils are looked upon as icons, as, uh, as, as being uh, relics of almost gods, things that have created us. Again, let me quote Philip Johnson in his book, uh, Darwin on Trial. He says, the, the priceless and fragile relics were carried by anxious curators in first-class airplane seats and brought to the museum in a VIP motorcade of limousines with a police escort. Inside the museum, the relics were placed behind bulletproof glass to be admired by a select preview audience of anthropologists who spoke in hush voices because it was like discussing theology in a cathedral. A sociologist observing the ritual of the anthropologist tribe remarked, sounds like ancestor worship to me. Friends, the fossil evidence does not straightforwardly support the idea of evolution. Now, I, I want to take pains to say, I, I do understand enough about evolutionary theory to say that evolutionists do not rely on the fossil evidence alone at all. I'm just saying that in the popular mind, that's thought to be the chief pillar. And again, uh, quoting from Johnson, he says this, the story of human descent from apes is not merely a scientific hypothesis. It's the secular equivalent of the story of Adam and Eve and a matter of immense cultural importance. Propagating the story requires illustrations, museum exhibits, television reenactments. It also requires a priesthood in the form of thousands of researchers, teachers, and artists who provide realistic and imaginative detail and carry the story out to the general public. Friends, I think this is true. And if I could say many evolutionists, not all by any means, but many evolutionists are not really interested in testing if their theory is true. You see, they believe that once you ignore the creating hand of God that we just read about here in Genesis chapter 1, once you ignore the creating hand of God, evolution is the best or perhaps the only explanation at hand. So their job is simply to figure out how evolution worked, not if it's true. It's just the only thing out there. Now, with some of the weaknesses inherent, at least from the fossil evidence, and I just want to repeat, I do understand that that's not the only pillar on which evolutionary theory stands, but, but it is the main one in the popular mind. Why is the theory of evolution so universally believed today? There's different opinions on this. Let me give you one angle, at least from an American perspective. I can't really speak well for what it is in other parts of the world, but from an American perspective, in the 1920s, a former substitute teacher in a Tennessee school volunteered to be the defendant in a case meant to challenge a Tennessee state law prohibiting the teaching of evolution in the public schools. The teacher wasn't even sure that he had taught evolution, but the trial went ahead and prosecuting the case was a man named William Jennings Bryan. He was the former Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, and he was a three-time Democratic Party candidate for president. William Jennings Bryan believed in the Bible, but not literally. He thought that the days of creation did not refer to 24-hour days, but to historical ages of indefinite duration. Leading the defense was a man named Clarence Darrow. He was a famous criminal lawyer and an agnostic lecturer. Darrow, using his skill as an attorney, maneuvered Brian to take the stand as an expert witness on the Bible, and he humiliated William Jennings Bryan in a devastating cross-examination. Once that purpose was accomplished, Darrow then 
pleaded guilty on behalf of his client and they paid a hundred dollar fine. So as a legal matter, the trial was inconclusive, but what came to be called the scopes monkey trial was presented to the world by sarcastic journalist, H L Menneken, Broadway, Hollywood, all of them put together in a large public relations triumph for Darwinism, for evolution. People who believed in God's creation came to be thought of as fools. You know, what we would call in America, hicks, kind of dumb farmers. And evolution was given the cover of respectability. Now, if you combine this with a strong anti-supernaturalism on the part of many scientists and educators, today's acceptance of evolution is more understandable. And I think the same attitude is used today to knock down debate and questions about evolution. But it's very important for us, I believe, as believers to be absolutely vigilant in saying, not only in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but the creation of man happened just as Genesis chapter one says that it did. If we depart from that, I think we depart from the truth that man is made in the image of God and has an inherent dignity, an inherent value. We're more than just specks in the universe. We are individual human beings made in the image of God. Now, before we finish here today, let's talk briefly about how Genesis chapter one, verses 24 to the end of the chapter, how does this point to Jesus? And I'm just going to give you one way. Let's come back to the idea that human beings are made in the image of God. I think that this has very real implications for the person and work of Jesus Christ. The fact that human beings are made in God's image means that the incarnation was truly possible. You understand what I mean by the incarnation? I mean that when God, the son, the second person of the Trinity added humanity to his deity and came as a man and walked among us, that was the incarnation. When Jesus was conceived as a baby in Mary's womb, that was the beginning of the incarnation. Again, humanity added to deity. And I would just simply say this, that because man is made in God's image, deity and humanity are not the same, but they are compatible. May I emphasize that? Deity and humanity are not the same. We are not like junior gods, but there's a compatibility between deity and humanity because we were purposefully made in God's image. And that means that Jesus could add humanity to his deity, that there was a compatibility, a connection between the two. I don't mean to sound strange or, or, or weird in this, but it's as if you could put those two natures together in one person and they wouldn't explode or have some kind of reaction. There's a compatibility between humanity and deity. This means that, of course, Jesus Christ was and is truly God and truly man. Friends, biblically speaking, we run into a lot of trouble when we forsake either one of those. When we allow ourselves to think that Jesus was not truly man or was not truly God. No, he was. Sometimes we say fully man and fully God. I think probably technically it's better to say truly man and truly God, but he was both human and divine. And one more thing to think about, the humanity of Jesus was not temporary. I like what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Do you grab a hold of that, friend? You see, this is Paul writing after Jesus died on the cross, after Jesus rose from the dead, after Jesus ascended to heaven. Matter of fact, I, I could speculate that this was uh, probably close to 60, excuse me, 30 years after Jesus had ascended to heaven. 
that Paul wrote this. There is one mediator between God and man. Not there was, there is. And it is the man, Christ Jesus. Some people have the mistaken idea that the humanity of Jesus was something like a coat that he put on when he left heaven, came to earth, and then he took that coat of humanity off when he went back to heaven. Not at all. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Well, friends, I hope that you realize that this means you have a Savior in heaven. You have a mediator who intercedes for you, who knows what it's like to be human. God has drawn near to us. That image that we always use at Christmas time, Emmanuel, God with us, it is true and it's possible because of something that we first learn of in Genesis 1. God created it so that man is made in his image so that we could have true fellowship with him and he could draw near to us. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Let's thank the Lord for that now. Father in heaven, we do thank you. We thank you that every human being is made in your image. And we ask, Lord God, that you would give us an ability to appreciate that, to understand it, and to walk in it. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your power. And we thank you that there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. We look to you, Jesus, as our only mediator, our only savior, and our sympathetic high priest. Thank you for it all, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.